I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. With just one word, the darkness has to retreat. With just one word, I feel the presence of heaven. With just one touch.
This morning I'll be reading out of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9 in the New Living Translation. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and incinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when we raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. So thankful for God's grace this morning. So thankful that it can be well with our soul because of God's grace. Not anything that we've done, but only what he's done. When peace like a
copy of God's Word, go to the book of Romans. Thank you, choir and worship team and Cole for leading us to the throne room this morning in worship to King Jesus. Romans chapter 15, verses 22 through 33. As soon as you find that passage, stand with me and let's read God's Word together. Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 22 the Apostle Paul writes this is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you but now since I no longer have any room for work in these regions and since I have longed for many years to come to you I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while at present however I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them which What has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Pray with me. Father, thank you for this opportunity of worship. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of singing your word, preaching your word, praying your word. We pray, Father, that you you alone would be pleased by our worship that we bring before you today and every day. Lord, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross and God, you would speak to the hearts of your people this morning. And I pray, God, that we would be different than when we came in to worship this morning when we leave. I pray that we would be different. Our hearts would be changed Because we have been in your presence and we have heard your word. And we desire to be doers of your word. So Lord, work in every heart in this room and all those who are watching online. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. March Madness is upon us, right? I heard an amen. There you go. For basketball fans, this is the best time of year. You might remember Florida Atlantic University men's basketball team unexpectedly made it all the way to the Final Four last year, 2023. It's kind of odd. It's a team that really had no superstars, but they relied on teamwork. Nine players on the Owls team averaged 15 minutes plus during the season and the starting rotation actually changed several times. This selfless team spirit was exemplified earlier in the season between a fifth year senior named Michael Forrest who lost his starting job to Nick Boyd because of an injury. When Forrest returned, Boyd actually offered to give up his starting role back to the fifth year senior 
coach Dusty May declined to make the change. As you well know, in a lot of teams, that would tear apart that team. Or at least it would have affected the dynamics of the team, but Florida Atlantic continued to win. Forrest, the player who was injured and replaced, said, it doesn't really matter who starts, who finishes, it just matters about what you do on the court. Everyone's just playing to win, everyone's playing for each other, so that's really what the difference is. As I think about Florida Atlantic and their run to the Final Four last year, it made me think, what if that same teamwork that was exhibited on the basketball court by Florida Atlantic, Florida Atlantic happened in the church world. What would happen if churches and gospel partners came together to make Jesus known? The Apostle Paul participated in, encouraged, and even fostered such missional partnerships. And as a result, many people heard the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, and God himself received much glory. So this morning, from God's Word, we will learn that missional partnerships happen when God's people partner in the gospel all for God's glory. As we walk through the text this morning, I want us to notice some elements of this gospel partnership that are a necessity. Number one, we see in verses 22 through 24 that missional partnerships require gospel longing or gospel ambition, whatever word you want to use there. Paul writes, this is the reason why, verse 22, I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I've longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while. The Bible makes it very clear, especially the book of Romans, that the apostle Paul longed to, wanted to go to Rome. He longed to go to Rome. However, he was unable to go there because he was busy preaching the gospel to those who had never heard it. We talked about that last Sunday in the previous verses in chapter 15. Paul's desire, his ambition, if you will, his aim was to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ where the gospel had never been preached. He's what we would call a pioneer missionary. And you can read about that in verses 20 and 21. We studied those last Sunday. He had, a, he had a pioneer missionary spirit. And as a result, he desired to preach Christ, to make Christ known in regions where Christ was not known. And so that gospel work kept Paul from visiting the church in Rome. Most New Testament scholars believe that Paul wrote the letter to the church in Rome while in Corinth during his third missionary journey. How easy would it would have been for the Apostle Paul to deliver the letter to Rome himself, he could have easily have done that, and then just continue on from Rome to Spain. Had Paul only been concerned with himself and his personal desires, he, he likely would have done that. But instead, as we continue studying, we see in these following verses that Paul's going to take a love offering to the church in Jerusalem, collected by churches in Macedonia and Achaia. You can read about that in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And this is, this is a reminder, church, that sometimes in life we're confronted with where we want to go versus where God wants us to go. Or what we want to do versus what God wants us to do. God doesn't always send us where we want to go. Anybody remember the story of Jonah in the Old Testament? God said go to Nineveh. It's safe to say that that's not where Jonah wanted to go. And it's safe to say that God did not send Jonah to the place where he wanted to go. During our um, seminary days, Mandy and I began to pray, Lord, where, where do you want us to go? And I don't know that she ever said it out loud, but I, I think in her heart, Mandy said, anywhere but Mississippi. And guess what? God took us to South Mississippi, and a hurricane hit in the midst of it. I've often wished that Mandy would have said, you know, like, Lord, don't send us to Hawaii or First Baptist Bahamas, but... 
she said Mississippi. When we're confronted with going where we want to go versus going where God wants us to go, we are very wise, like the Apostle Paul, to choose obedience to the Lord. When Paul said he no longer has any room for work in, this region, in these regions, he doesn't mean that everybody in those regions were converted to Christianity and that, that there was no more need for gospel work. Instead, remember, Paul was laying a foundation. He was involved in church planning efforts in these regions, but there was still work to be done, just like here. We have a lot of churches, but there's still work to be done in central Kentucky for the sake of the gospel. However, Paul realized it would be others who would come along and maybe he planted the seeds, but others would come along and water those seeds that Paul had planted. There'd be others who would come behind Paul, in other words, to continue the gospel work. Notice verse 24. <coughs> Paul writes, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while. When Paul talks about Spain, he's speaking about the Iberian Peninsula, which includes modern-day Spain and Portugal. Rome would have been a really a strategic base, a jumping-off point from Rome to, to Spain a launching pad, if you will, for a missionary journey to Spain. Paul writes, to be helped on my journey there by you. It, it sounds as if Paul hoped that the believers in Rome would help support the missionary journey to Spain in, a, in financial ways. And he hoped that through the collection, Gentile believers could show their generosity and their love for the Jewish brothers and sisters. He also hoped that it would promote unity between Jewish believers and Gentile believers, which we've seen is a, is a big key premise in the book of Romans. And it would be, in that sense, it would be a win-win scenario. The gospel spreads, Jesus is made known, and Gentile and Jewish believers would come together in one unified body. One more interesting phrase here in verse 24. Paul writes, once I've enjoyed your company for a while. I mean, this is a compliment that the Apostle Paul is, is giving to the, church, to the believers there in Rome. He's saying that he being able to spend time with the believers in Rome would be spiritually refreshing to him. And I, I thought about that this week. <clears throat> I began to ask, you know, do we have that same effect on other, other people? Are, are we refreshing? Would others compliment Campbellsville Baptist Church like Paul complimented the church in Rome? Would they say it was good for us to be with the people of Campbellsville Baptist Church? It was spiritually refreshing. Would they say that of you? Paul longed to spread the gospel in Spain and enjoy spiritual ref refreshing with the believers in Rome. But before Rome, Paul's ambition, his longing, was to take the gospel to places where Jesus was completely unknown. And I think we can learn some things from this church. Paul teaches us that without gospel ambition, without gospel aim, without gospel longing, there can be no gospel partnerships. There, there's got to be a, a passion in our heart. There's got to be a fire in our hearts that Jesus is made known. And so then we begin to, we have to ask ourselves, do I have that kind of gospel ambition? Do I have that kind of gospel longing? Does my church have that kind of gospel ambition and longing? Do I, do I long to make Christ known? Does Campbellsville Baptist Church long to make Jesus known? And some of you may be asking, well, Pastor, that sounds great, but where does that gospel longing, that gospel ambition, where does that even come from? Like, where does that originate? And I believe you have to keep on reading in the text to get that answer. So missional partnerships require gospel longing. Number two, we see in the text that missional partnerships require sacrificial giving. I want you to notice what happens in verse 25 and following. Paul writes, At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, 
bringing aid to the saints. We talked about that a few minutes ago. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they also ought to be of service to them in material blessings. These few verses answer some questions, or you can ask some questions of these few verses. First, you can ask what, or excuse me, when. Well, Paul says, at present. So Paul, in other words, had tentative future plans to go to Rome. However, his current plan was to go to Jerusalem and do what? That's the second question. Paul had collected money. We read about that from the churches in Macedonia and Achaia, specifically for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem, for poor uh, Jewish believers. And that also answers the who. He collected this love offering for churches in those church from churches in those regions. And by the way, that would included would include the cities of Philippi, Thessalonica, and Corinth. Now what strikes me is they weren't reluctant givers. Did you notice that? Paul said they were pleased to do it. They were, they were excited about being able to give back to the mother church, if you will, in Jerusalem and help the believers there, the Jewish believers. Why? And Paul answers that question. Because the Gentiles had come to share in the Jews' spiritual blessings. So the very least that the Gentiles could do was to serve them with material blessings. In other words, the Gentile churches had an obligation to the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. And some of you may be, well, why? Why were Gentile believers, why did they feel obligated to these Jewish believers? The Gentile Christians, think about it, had had come to share in the blessings of the Jewish Christians. The Bible talks about salvation is of the Jews, for that, that nation was entrusted with the very oracles of God, and the Savior himself was Jewish. We studied that in Romans chapter 9. And because they had received the spiritual blessings of salvation through this Jewish Messiah, they had a debt of gratitude to pay to the Jewish church in the form of contributing to their material needs out of thankfulness for what the Jews had given and shared with them. By the way, just a side note, consider it was Jewish apostles who wrote the vast majority of the New Testament. Luke Acts probably being the exception. And preached the gospel to the Gentiles. I mean, it's safe to stay, say we still owe a great, a great deal of gratitude to the Jewish people. In verse 28, Paul adds that after delivering the offering to Jerusalem, he would leave for Spain by way of Rome. And interestingly, we're going to see this unfold. We'll talk about this a little more throughout the sermon. Paul was imprisoned after he arrived in Jerusalem. Eventually, he would make it to Rome. You can read about that in Acts chapters 22 through 28, but not the way that he intended He made it to Rome as a prisoner, not the way that Paul expected. In verse 29, Paul writes, I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessings of Christ. A couple of things jump off the page to me when I read this. Number one, we see that Paul's certainty here. Did you see that? Paul does this from time to time in in his writings. He will say, I know. Well, that's, that's what he does here. He knows with certainty that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessings of Christ. When you first read that, it kind of comes across, maybe at first reading, maybe a little arrogant. When I come to Rome, you guys, I know you guys will be blessed when I come to Rome. Oh, Paul's not being arrogant here. But Paul is expressing confidence. He's expressing confidence in Jesus, in Christ. Not not himself, he's expressing confidence in Jesus. How interesting that Paul didn't know it at the time, but his coming to them in the fullness of the blessings of Christ was through his imprisonment. He had no idea that that was going to happen. Go back to Romans chapter 1. A lot of popping going on in it. Romans chapter 1. Verse 
This is a good reminder, and it's been a while since we were in Romans 1. In Romans 1, 11 and 12. Remember what Paul had said, For I long to see you, He's speaking to these believers in Rome, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both, both yours and mine. And so this, this is something, Paul was looking forward to his arrival with these believers in Rome, and, and it included both a, a fruitful ministry among the believers there and the enjoyment of being able to mutually encourage one another. And I want you to think about, church, that sacrificial giving is a vital component of gospel partnerships. It made me think this week about the gospel partnerships that the Lord has blessed our church with at Campbellsville Baptist. I mean, think about it. We, we partner with other churches in our county, Taylor County Baptist Association. We partner with the Southern Baptist Convention. We partner with the Kentucky Baptist Convention. We partner with the North American Mission Board. We partner with the International Mission Board. We partner with churches in Cincinnati, Grace Church and Bridge City Church that are new church starts. We partner with Samaritan's Purse, Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Ministry. We, we partner with Hope Pregnancy Center here in our community. We partner with Hometown Connect. We partner with our local schools to help feed children during the summer months and we participate in Room at the Inn and seeking to be a blessing to those families. And guess what? All of those are great gospel partnerships. And every one of them require sacrificial giving. If there's no sacrificial giving, then we're not able to help monetarily these different ministries. So this is a great opportunity and a plug for me to be able to, as your pastor to say, man, thank you for giving sacrificially so that we can make Jesus known and so that we can partner with all of these great gospel organizations. When I was thinking about this this week, there were at least two things that came to mind that happens when we give sacrificially. One is obvious and the other is not so obvious. So I'm going to begin with the obvious one first. By the way, the not so obvious one is just as important as the obvious one. Here's the obvious one. When we give sacrificially, y'all ready for this? This is a light bulb moment. You're going to be blown away by this statement. The Lord uses our gifts to help others. Wow. I mean, that's the given, right? That's the obvious one. But I don't know if we think about the not so obvious answer. Blessing. When we give sacrificially, the Lord uses our gifts to bind us together as one in these gospel partnerships. So we're one with Grace Church. When, when Grace Church, when Pastor Will and I have the opportunity to, to share videos of what's going on at Grace Church and, and they're seeing people saved and baptized, Grace Church in Cincinnati, man, we rejoice in that. Because we're gospel partners. We're together as one. Same thing when Bridge City Church sees God move in great and mighty ways. Same thing should happen when other Southern Baptist churches in the Taylor County Baptist Association grow and see people saved and baptized. We go on mission trips and see people saved. We're, we're a part of them. We're a part of one another because we are one in Christ Jesus. And so we should, man, that's awesome, right? We should be excited about that. When, when we hear what's happening in Belize and other places in the world through gospel works that we partner with, we ought to rejoice because God's at work. This is not competition. This is kingdom work, right? So two things. One, we know the Lord will, in his, by His grace, He will choose to use our gifts to help others. But secondly, what's not so obvious is the Lord will use our gifts to bring us closer together. That's what was happening here in the, in the early church, in the church of Rome. Paul was 
making sure that these Gentile believers were giving and helping the Jewish believers back in Jerusalem so that why? So that the Jewish believers would certainly be helped. They needed help. They needed financial help, but also so that the gospel would be further proclaimed and propagated and also so that Jewish and Gentile believers would come together as one in the body of Christ. So missional partnerships require sacrificial giving. And thirdly, missional partnerships require passionate praying. Passionate praying. Look at verse 30. Go back to Romans 15, though. You're like me, maybe still in Romans 1. Romans 15, verse 30. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will... I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Towards the beginning of this letter, Paul told the believers in Rome that he was praying for them. Go back to Romans chapter 1, verse 9 and following. So it's more than appropriate for Paul to ask the Roman believers to pray for him. And here are some thoughts about this section to our praying and how it relates to our praying for missional partnerships. Number one, notice there's some stimulating factors in our praying for missional partnerships. Stimulating factors. Notice what he said there in verse 30. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. Paul reminds the believers in Rome that, that we have one common Lord and we have one common love being the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so in other words, what is it that motivates us? Remember, remember me talking about that at the very beginning of the sermon? We, missional partnerships require missional longing or gospel longing. And I told you we're going to talk more about that later. How does that happen? What motivates us to struggle and not give up on missional partnerships? What motivates us to struggle and not give up in our praying? The Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Spirit of God that indwells and fills every believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are our stimulating factors in our praying for missional partnerships. Secondly, notice the struggle. There's stimulating factors, but there's also the struggle in our praying for missional partnerships. You see what he said? If I love Paul's honesty here, right? Strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. The word strive that's used here in my ESV text is translated as struggle in some of your English texts. And it reminds us that prayer is in and of itself a supernatural work. It really is. It's, it's supernatural. And it's supernatural to continue in praying when you feel like throwing in the towel. Why do we strive again, or what do we strive against when we pray? Well, in Ephesians 6, <clears throat> Paul talks about how we wrestle against principalities and powers of darkness, and certainly that's at work in working against us in praying. But interestingly, Paul doesn't specify here in Romans chapter 15 are any adversary with whom we're to strive against. It may be that he is simply representing prayer as an activity demanding great work, great exertion, a struggle, in fact, within ourselves in which we seek to align ourselves with God's will. By the way, struggling and striving in prayer is real. It's real. And, and if you're struggling and striving in your prayer, please know you are not alone. You're not alone in that endeavor. Someone once said wisely that our struggle to pray is good. Did you hear me? When I first read that, I thought, that's nuts. Why would that be a good thing? Our struggle, struggle to pray is good because it reveals that the Spirit has given us a desire to pray. If you're not struggling, 
and you're not praying, our struggle to pray is a good thing because it, it reveals the spirit that indwells us, has given us a desire to pray in the first place. The trouble comes when competing desires distract us from pursuing God. And think about it, sometimes these struggles are because of a lack of head knowledge. In other words, we don't know what to pray about or why, why should we do it. But sometimes it's a heart issue. Our sin or our pain trips us up. And so church, listen, sometimes you're going you're gonna to struggle to pray at times and you're going to be tempted to give up. But resist that temptation and persist in prayer. By the way, a great book about this very topic is When Prayer is a Struggle is the name of it, A Practical Guide for Overcoming Obstacles in Prayer. It's by an author by the name of Kevin Holleran, Holleran H-A-L-L-O-R-A-N, When Prayer is a Struggle. So what I want you to realize this morning is, man, missional partnerships require passionate praying, and there's going to be times in your spiritual journey and in my spiritual journey that praying is a struggle. And that's when we want, we've got to pray it through, right? We, we get back on our knees. We get back to praying before holy God. So we've seen here the stimulating factors. We saw the struggle in our praying. And thirdly, notice the specific nature of our praying for missional partnerships. Go back to, I want to read this one more time, verses 31 and 2. Paul writes that I made, so these are specific prayer requests, right? You with me? Everybody with me? Stick with me. we got a few more minutes. This means yes, you're with me. This means no. I didn't see any no's, so you're with me, all right? Specific prayer request, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. So Paul's going to share at least two specific prayer requests in those verses. Some people see it as three. So let's look at them one by one. Verse 31, pray that I will be rescued from those in Judea who refuse to obey God. So Paul's first prayer request relates to unbelievers in Jerusalem, right? There were believing Jews and there were certainly unbelieving Jews. And Paul is asking the believers in Rome to pray for him to be rescued from the unbelievers in Jerusalem. Why this request from Paul? Because Paul knows that he has many enemies among the unbelieving Jews who were doubtlessly planning and scheming for his downfall, even his death. So he knows that he's in danger, even for his life. So he's asking these believers in Rome to pray for his protection and deliverance. That was prayer request number one. Here's number two, the end of verse 31. Pray also that believers there will be willing to accept the donation I'm taking to Jerusalem. So now Paul's going to transition from praying for, asking them to pray for him for deliverance from unbelievers to now, hey, pray, these Roman believers, pray so that these believing Jews in Jerusalem will be willing to receive this offering that was collected by these Gentile believers. And why in the world is that such a big deal? Because Paul realized that it may be difficult for them to accept the offering, not just in a general sense, like, you know, sometimes we don't want to accept money or whatever from other people, but in a much more specific sense. In accepting the gift from Paul, Jewish Christian leaders would be seemingly endorsing Paul's gospel and seemingly disregarding Jewish law and traditions. So if, if his offering, Paul's offering collected by these Jewish believers were to be rejected, this could cause a, a rift or a further rift between Jewish and Gentile believers. So what do you do if you're Paul? What, if you, what do you do if you're Apostle Paul? Do you worry? Well, I'm just going to worry about this. I mean, that's our default, right? I'm just going to worry. Like, worry is going to fix the problem, right? You're going to plead with the Jewish believers? No, listen to me. You have to receive this offering so that you don't cause a further rift between Jewish believers and, uh, and Gentile believers. No. Paul didn't worry. At least we don't see it here in the text. Paul didn't necessarily plead in this part with the Jewish believers. We don't see that language. No. You pray. 
That's what Paul says. And you ask other believers to join with you in prayer. Why? Because God can do more, God can do more in one second with us on our knees in prayer than you or I could do an entire lifetime. That's one of many reasons why we need to be on our knees before holy God. Verse 32, so that by God's will I, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. If the first two prayers are answered by God, what were they? Being rescued from the Jewish unbelievers in Jerusalem and that the Jewish believers would be willing to accept the love offering, then guess what? By God's will, Paul will come to the believers in Rome with joy and be refreshed in their company. So, what happened? Maybe some of you have that question in the back of your mind. Did God answer those prayer requests? Like what happened with those two or three prayer requests? Inquiring minds want to know, right? That just dated me. The Bible tells us, prayer request number one. Remember, delivered from Jewish unbelievers in Jerusalem. Was that prayer answered? Yes. Although Paul was arrested in Jerusalem, he was not killed. Go to Acts 23.10. So it, didn't, it wasn't answered in the way that the Apostle Paul hoped that it would be answered, right? But God answered that prayer. Prayer request number two. Jewish believers accepting the love offering. Did they? Yes. Go to Acts chapter 21, 17. And the Jewish believers received Paul and James and the elders with gladness, the Bible tells us. Well, what about if it is? I think it is. Prayer request number three. Paul going to Rome with, with joy and mutual encouragement. Remember that? Yes. Acts 25. Although it was not the way that Paul probably anticipated his arrival in Rome. Because he was a prisoner. He was in chains. But according to Acts 28, he did come with the joy of Jesus and as an encouragement to fellow believers in Rome. So much could be said here, but I'll simply say this. When you pray specifically for missional partnerships and generally when you pray for anything, pray it through. Keep on striving. Keep on struggling. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. And please pray specifically. That's what Paul teaches us here. Pray specifically. There are tons of reasons why we should pray specifically, but let me just give you one. Praying for specific needs makes us, guess what, more alert to God's answers. When we pray specifically, it makes us more alert to God's answers. If I pray, Lord, bless them, just generally speaking, Lord, bless them, God may answer that prayer request, but I may not recognize the answer when it comes. But if on the other hand, I pray for, give us this day our daily bread, right? Or something similarly specific, I will be more attentive and alert to the answer when it comes. Paul wraps up chapter 15 with verse 33. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. This is a third benediction from the Apostle Paul. It's a prayer in which, having asked for their prayers, now he prays for them again. And he chooses this time, interestingly, to call God the God of peace. Shalom, right? Reconciliation. It's a central Jewish concern, shalom. And that he deliberately writes, not with you, may the God of peace be with you, but did you notice? He says, be with you all. That implies that Paul's mind is preoccupied to the very end with Gentile and Jewish unity. So what have we learned from God's word this morning, church? Missional partnerships happen when God's people partner in the gospel all for God's glory. So, how do I respond to this message? Number one, give. Give. And when I say give, by the way, Paul not only gave, he not only collected an offering from Gentile believers. When we think of give, the first thing we think of is money. Okay, I get that. Paul also gave of himself, right? 
He sacrificed himself. He was willing to go back to Jerusalem to deliver this offering, and he knew what potentially could happen when he went back to Jerusalem. So give. Give of yourself. Give of your time. Give of your resources. Give of your material blessings, certainly. We talk about the Annie Armstrong Easter offering for North American missions. That's supporting church planning and evangelism efforts all over North America. Give and give generously. Number two, pray. And pray specifically, right? Don't just toss out general prayers. Pray specifically and pray it through. Pray it through. Don't give up. So not only give and pray, but go. Man, we've got awesome opportunities for short-term mission trips in 2024. West Virginia in April. Another Belize mission trip, I believe, in July. Detroit, Michigan trip. And by the way, you do know there's a mission sending place and a mission field that's right across the street from us. It's called Campbellsville University. Many of us don't have to board international flights to reach people from other religions and cultures. We just need to open our eyes. Look around, engage the nations that, are, that is in right here in our backyard in Campbellsville. You do realize 80% of international students that come to America never see the inside of an American home during their stay. 80%. I've heard tear-jerking stories of how some international students bring a suitcase of gifts with them because they fully anticipate being able to come into American homes while they're students at whatever college or university that they're attending, and they want to be able to leave a gift from their, from their home, from their culture, and they are unable to because they're never invited into American homes while they're here. That should not happen here in Campbellsville, Kentucky. Amen, church? Let's, let's love on the nations, love on college students that are right across the street. You stand with me this morning? How do we respond? We, well, we listen to the Lord first and foremost. We seek to walk in obedience to Him. We give, we pray, pray specifically, and we go where the Lord sends us, even across the street. So our musicians come, will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Thank you for missional partnerships that you've blessed our church with. May we be faithful and diligent in those missional partnerships. Lord, thank you for what you taught us or maybe reminded us this morning about prayer. Pray specifically, Lord, that we would not only pray specifically, but Lord, that we would strive in praying, that we would pray it through and not give up. Lord, would you make of me a, a praying man? Lord, would you make of us a praying church? Lord, help us to see the important factors in these missional partnerships. May we be led by your spirit. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing together this morning, we want to invite you to respond to the Lord Jesus. He may be working in your heart in a multitude of different ways, but we invite you. We'll have prayer partners. We invite you to respond to him this morning.
Don't. 